I'm a lecturer in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Chicago. And uh, before we proceed, I'd like to thank our uh, sponsors who made this event possible. Chicago Studies, the Slavic Department, uh, the Center for East Euro Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and Theater and Performance Studies. And it's a deep honor for me to introduce our guests tonight, and I want to thank each one of you for making the time in the, your busy schedules to come and talk to us tonight, so thank you. Uh, I will read a very brief introduction for each one of you, and then we'll turn it over for discussion. Uh, I'll start, let's see, I'll actually start in order of uh, uh, people uh, 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 sitting. Zlatomir Moldovansky is the artistic director of the newly formed Rose Valley Theater Group, uh, devoted to bringing previously undiscovered international plays to Chicago stages. He's Bulgarian-American, who started his professional journey as a child actor in the Plovdiv Drama Theater in Chicago, which is also my hometown. So, uh, yes, so I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. uh, his stage credit include Stanford Festival of Canada, Looking Glass Theatre, Creed Repertory Theatre, Saul Repertory Theatre, and many others. Zlatomir has also performed a one-man play based on short stories of Bulgarian writers throughout the US and Canada. He's also an acting instructor specializing in the uh, Nikolai Demidov, uh, Demidov organic technique, which he has taught in a Saul Conservatory, Ringling College of Arts and Design, University of Cincinnati, the New College of Florida, and the State College of Florida. Um, the Natasha Vucurovic uh, Dukic uh, was a co-founder with her husband, and a co-founder of the Tuta uh, Theater Group, which was founded here in rather in the States, but in Washington, D.C. in 1995, and then in 2002 was moved to Chicago. Uh, she was the design, set design, the costume design uh, 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 designer, sorry. Uh, I'm an immigrant too, and Bulgarian uh, uh, begins to show up. Tuta presented numerous US premieres of foreign plays from France, Russia, Austria, and Serbia. It produced six world premieres, five US premieres, five Midwest premieres. Uh, Natasha has also, as already uh, mentioned, has also worked locally on projects with the Trapdoor Theater, European Rep, Northwestern University Opera, Roosevelt, and the Paul University Operas. Works, uh, worked, uh, worked on projects nationally and internationally. She also holds a, an MFA in design from the University of Maryland and has taught theater design and design history at James Madison University in Virginia, Loyola University uh, in Chicago. She also works in the trade show and exhibit industry. Um, and next is our guest Yasin Pijankov, uh, who began his acting career in Bulgaria. Uh, he graduated from the National Academy of Theatre and Film Arts in Sofia. He came to Chicago in 1990, and in 1992 co-founded the European Repertory Company, where for the next 10 years he directed and acted or produced over 20 productions. Since 2002, he has been an ensemble member at Steppenwolf, where he's appeared in 18 productions and directed six plays. And just last night, he was on stage in the opening night of the Chicago premiere of Lucy Kirk's Kirkwood's play, The Children. So we we'll would be very interested to find out about that. He has translated plays to and from English. Uh, he's also appeared in film and TV series. And since 2007, he's been the head of theater program in University of Illinois at Chicago. And uh, sitting farthest from my right, uh, Zelko Djukic, who, is a co as, already, as you already heard, was the uh, co-founder of Tuta Theatre, uh, which uh, I uh, 
now the Petkovic who is sitting here on my left took me to see the first year I was teaching here at the, in, in the university. And I still very vividly remember that performance. It was amazing. What did you see? Uh, tracks. Yeah. Uh, so, so I have also a personal connection with that. that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so uh, Jacques Tukic was the arti artistic director for Tuta. And he directed most of Tuta productions between 2012 and two, uh, sorry, 2002 and 2012. He also directed plays nationally and internationally. Um, the staging, Tuta's staging of Uncle Vanya was pronounced the best production in Chicago in 2008 by the Chicago Reader. And uh, locally, he's worked with the uh, European Repertoire, the Repertoire Theater and Trapdoor Theater and, and many others. Currently, he is a freelance director and teaching at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Please join me in welcoming our guests. This was all, I think, sorted by the age from all the <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to start uh, by asking uh, each of you, in whichever order you decide, uh, descending or ascending age, um, to uh, reflect for us for, for just a few minutes um, how your immigrant experience, how the experience of an immigrant has informed your relationship, creative relationship to theater, acting, or uh, choice of plays or whatever else you, you feel, if it has changed it, maybe it hasn't, uh, how it's informed it. And after that, we'll open it for, for questions. Thank you. Can I start? Please yes. do. Okay. So first, of, first of all, I, I wanted to, to thank you guys for, for being here and for inviting us in here. Um, I think it is interesting, in addition to what you were just talking, you are the youngest and the youngest member of the Chicago theater community, so I want to welcome you on behalf of all, all us immigrants in the Chicago theater. But like half of the plays that you mentioned, the three of us did together, or the, the Yasin and I did, or Jeko and Yasin teach together. So being a part of a theater community, I think theater is a nationality, not necessarily a profession. So in that sense, like being an immigrant as a, as a theater person, you're always an immigrant or you're always part of the community. And I think it is really interesting that you invited us to talk about Chicago because from being a theater artist, one of the things that you have to do is you have to become a part of the community that you're in. Um, as opposed to many other artists that have the luxury or maybe disadvantage of being on their own when they create their art. Um, uh, we create our art uh, when the room is full of other people and other artists. And it's a pleasure and an honor and maybe a disadvantage <laughs> that we have to work in that, in that sense and in that way. But we are really kind of like, and yes, being an immigrant definitely is kind of throws us for a loop or throws other people for a loop every once in a while. But you're definitely, you know, part of that theatrical community and therefore the community of people who come to see theater and therefore part of the Chicago community in general. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> He's used to me talking way more than this. <laughs> Should I? I okay. Yeah, All right. Um, Well, having what we bring with us is obviously different cultures and different experience. We we all come from Eastern Europe, two countries that are actually next to each other. Um, Zlatomir and I are from Bulgaria, and uh, Jeko and Natasha from Serbia, um, or the former Yugoslavia. So, um, and our language is also very similar. As a matter of fact, we've experimented talking to each other in our own <laughs> languages and understanding every word. Um, and and it's, a, it's a specific place uh, called the Balkans, which um, not many people know about that part of Europe, Eastern Europe. So, um, when um, I started European Repertoire Company in 1992 with Dale Goulding, who is from England, 
we wanted to originally bring works by European authors that otherwise would be unknown to Chicago audiences. And um, we have done everything from uh, Soviet authors from the 60s to um, 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 absurdists from Poland, Slavomir Mrozek, and um, um, lesser known works by Chekhov, um, lesser known works by English play playwrights like Howard Barker, who has been barely produced, Stephen Burkhoff was another one. So we um, wanted to bring works that excited us as artists and also spoke to our culture and our background. We wanted to share something that we knew we were quite competent in doing and leave Mamet to, you know, the people from Chicago. Um, and this is how we started this theater company. And um, over the years, it kind of grew and developed, but we always had a passion to produce um, works that spoke artistically to us, that fulfilled some kind of need in our development as an artist, but it also uh, works that spoke to our humanity, to how we felt as artists, as European artists working in Chicago and in a way kind of trying to bridge the gap between, you know, the old world and the new world. And um, um, I remember Jaco and Natasha came to see a production that we did of Ivanov back in 1999. And from what I remember, it was one of the reasons that you guys decided that, oh, okay, there is there is actually, you know, um, audience for this thing here. And um, um, as a matter of fact, um, TUTA stands for the Utopian Theater Asylum, which I've always loved the title of their theater company. And, um, uh, and I've, Jaco and Natasha are also extraordinary artists and they they brought a whole new spectrum of works. Incidentally, European Repertory Company was already kind of on the way out when these guys were like on the way up. So in a way, I felt that they took the baton from us and continued to carry on that tradition. And now we have Zlatomir with... Uh, what was the name of Rose it? Valley Rose Valley Theater. Rose Valley Theater. Bulgaria, by the way, has the the best roses in the world. <laughs> best rose oil. Yeah, we even named it. Actually. Yes. So <laughs> yes, it's uh, the name is not incidental. Um, so this is what I mean. This is what we wanted to give to um, the Chicago community. We knew that Chicago was a, a vibrant community of immigrants there's a lot of immigrant communities and we've always kind of tried to reach them out you know when we did polish plays the polish community would come and see us when we did russian plays all the russians would come and see us for a while actually they've kind of embraced us as their theater company and uh and um, at one point we had a commission from the french consulate so the french came in and saw us uh, we did the world premiere of Roberto Zucco by Bernard Marie Coltes, which huge hit in Europe. Nobody ever knew about it in America. So we we kind of brought these works that um, not only spoke to us, but to the communities, you know, in the city, and also the Americans who wanted to come and see something that otherwise would never get produced. So. That was uh, that was our mission, and that's what we did, and um, and then everybody kind of <laughs> took their own way. <clears throat> well, um, yeah, I started I started as a child actor in Bulgaria, but I, I moved to the States as a teenager. So I suppose I, I had an option to completely 
go the American route, I guess, and, and not really um, take much from my the culture I was born into. But I found that to be impossible because in you know my agent or whoever sends me to auditions most of the time it doesn't have much to do, especially if it's theater, it doesn't have much to do with my culture. But it's, unless it's TV, then I'm always a Russian villain or something. <laughs> but but um, whenever I have some time to do the work I really want to do. I always find the most fulfillment in my Balkan Eastern European culture and especially the contemporary work that's produced in places like Bulgaria, Macedonia, Serbia, Romania is I find so present and so relatable in the West and if it weren't for theaters like the one Yasin founded and the one that Jelko Natasha founded, I, I don't think that this work would really come to the American stages because if you look at the Broadway repertoire or the major regional theaters and you think of Eastern Europe, you think Chekhov, Gogol, maybe Ostrovsky, maybe Dostoevsky here and there, and that's about it, you know. So I find it very important to bring these especially contemporary works or lesser known classical works uh, from our parts of the world, translate them well and produce them well, and that's really the, the impetus of my, uh, the, like the work that I develop on my own, including the one-man show and now this, this new theater company. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that the theater might be the most uh, suitable cultural cross-pollination field, just because people are in, in direct contact, I mean, as you are creating art, you are interacting with other artists, as you are uh, showing your art, people are right there in, in front of you. And there, there is something really immediate about that. that it's, uh, I mean, from theater history, we know that that's the case. The Russians in the 20s came in, in, on a tour in, in America, and uh, after that, the schools of acting started uh, being established in, across the United States. Uh, and uh, what's known as the American School of Acting started developing through Stanislavski's system. So, I mean, uh, being an immigrant in theater is, I think, uh, 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 sort of uh, different than being immigrant in, as, as, a, as a writer. Um, I remember when I started in Maryland, my English was, was not that good. Um, <laughs> And I was supposed to do a student show at the University of Maryland. And it was really hard to communicate. I mean, you were missing words, you were working with actors, and I thought that that might be it for my career as a theater director. <clears throat> but somehow, I don't know, like through, through using legs, arms, <laughs> charm, the, the, the communication still happened. And actors were very interested in my ideas, regardless of the fact that I couldn't express my thoughts uh, uh, verbally, uh, quite clearly, um, and little by little we did make the show, a quite exciting one. And, and then I realized how theater does have its own language, um, that's not just words. Um, in, and that opened up, inspired me to continue, to continue working, to continue working, to continue stay, stay true to your really um, um, core ideas and to your sense of, of what that is. Uh, so we started in, in, in Maryland and moved to Chicago because we liked uh, uh, theater in Chicago um, and this well-known and famous production of Ivano de Tiasen, uh, this theater produced at the time, and just found a found home in it. Uh, we, Natasha and I, moved to the United States in the early 90s when our country fell apart, uh, former Yugoslavia, and, uh, you know, you found more than just artistic identity in in, uh, in theater community. And that was a special case in Chicago because of such a large and diverse immigrant population. And as Yasin said, our audience in Tuta is in Europe was very much Eastern European uh, audience who found also part of the home. You know, theater in Eastern Europe, at least in, in, the, in the previous era, uh, was sort of a cult to go to theater. It wasn't just an, an, an entertainment. People, It's a cultural thing. Going to theater was equally to going to church, I think, or mm -hmm. some sort of uh, cultural thing that you, people didn't expect to be entertained. They, I mean, they did, but they also expected to, to see 
something more, something spiritual. And we tend to wanted to bring that into uh, our work too. So we didn't, I mean, while we were interested in commercial success, we didn't necessarily produce commercial work. We went and, uh, and did a variety of, of plays. So um, it, it, for us, it's, it's a quite, quite an extraordinary experience. And it's not just about giving, it's also about learning and taking from American culture and American theater tradition, because people bring their own uh, uh, interpretation and vision of, of uh, what certain situations that are studied and presented in, in different places are. So it's not, I, I always wanted to avoid being exotic theater um, and try to compete with other theater of the same scope and same, same size in, in town. And that was important that, it's a, that we are part of the community and they are looked as integral part of, of uh, cultural life in Chicago rather than something that is sort of interesting because it's exotic. So, and, and I think that was reflected in our work um, and that's why we kind of are still present in the life of Chicago. Thank you. Um, we'll open it to questions. Thank you. I think like from hearing what you said like theaters and nationality, I wanted to know more about like how you like where do you hire is there a hierarchy? Like is it theater first and then your cultural identity? Is it something different? And like, you know, previously was mentioned you guys end up playing Russian figures or figures that aren't of your own cultural identity. Is there some sort of tension when you play those characters or is there a sense of pride that, you know, even though I'm Serbian or I'm not Bulgarian or I am Bulgarian or Serbian, I'm still playing a Russian character or playing an Eastern European character. You know, a lot of TV shows will just say, oh, they're Eastern European and then it's a whole population that just gets covered. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I've played. He every, plays yeah. the Russian character. I, in TV, yeah. So. I, I keep joking that I've made more money from film and TV by knowing Russian than English. <laughs> True story. Um, yeah, I've played everything but a Bulgarian. Actually, <laughs> I've played a Serbian. I've played a Hungarian. I've played a Romanian. I've played a countless Russians. You're talking uh, Balkan. Yeah. yeah <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I mean, it's, I don't find that, I mean, the problem is that those roles are usually quite cliche because the people in the writer's rooms just kind of have a really kind of passing idea of what these people are. Um, that's the reason I played so many different Eastern Europeans. Um, but I, I always, I always find it useful to use my experience and connect to the humanity of those people. Even though, especially in TV and film, you don't have the depth of character you could find in a like a little scene. Um, but um, through my theater work, um, I have been able to actually kind of go beyond my accent and be cast in many many different roles in many different shows and um it's been every to me it doesn't matter where i mean right now i'm playing a guy from the east of england you know i'm doing an english accent i don't know how successful i'm in it but i'm doing it you know i'm playing the guy i don't think that's the most important thing What's the most important thing is how I connect to that person, how I connect to the humanity of the character, because that's what I always look for, both as a director and as an actor, to find the humanity of those people, because that's, that's what connects us in theater. That's, that's the language of theater, more than any other art, speaks the most to our shared humanity. And that's why the experiences that people get watching live theater are, are unique and, 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 um, and transcendent in a way where maybe you don't feel the same way by looking at a beautiful painting or listening to 
music um, or watching a movie. And I think it's it's an art, obviously it's an ancient art, and I, I see it being around, you know, even in the age of social media and, and all that. But it's still going strong. And again, like I said, it just connects all of us through our humanity, and that's why, you know, that's, that's what I look in my work, you know. You know, to kind of um, talk a little bit more, I'm a designer, right? So I'm not on stage like, like Yasin is or like directing people. But when you are thinking in terms of like what character, what nationality, what it is, I am always thinking about people who are going to be sharing with it with us. So it has to mean something to the people in the audience, mm -hmm. not just to the people on stage. And otherwise you end up in this museum piece and who cares? You know, so what you want to do is to make these people who are on stage, is it Yasin, is it Latunri, is it somebody else who is, who is born here, they should all be awesome as, you know, Czech characters. Mm -hmm. And as a designer, your job is to kind of help that along, move that along and avoid all the cliche, cliches. I was talking to a friend of ours, I, I, I apologize, I'm so underdressed because I just came from the plane from overseas mm -hmm. and it's so cold in here, <laughs> it's like <laughs> nothing to wear. Um, and I was talking to a friend of ours who is an actress and she's like Yasin, she's a, an international actress but she's from Belgrade, Serbia, living in London and she gets to do roles in London, she's a great actress but she's like mostly a maid to somebody because she's from Eastern Europe. At which time she is given this really sad looking polyester costume uh, because apparently nobody in Eastern Europe knows how to dress um, because, you know, they are not Eastern as, Europe. they're from Eastern Europe. And so, you know, she goes like, why not give me some dignity, you know, I mean, how many people do you see walking around London, regardless of who they are, where they're from, that are shabbily dressed? You don't, I mean, people tend to know how to dress. So I find it my personal mission to kind of make them more interesting, make them sculptural, make them uh, uh, make the help, help the actors tell a little bit more of that story without giving up too much at the beginning of the show. So you know, so to kind of help them carry that along. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think like, and you do kind of tend to think in terms of always the relevance for today. Because I think that's what we are doing, what we are doing, is uh, you're, you want to be in a conversation and you want to be in a very immediate conversation. And so everything that you put on stage has to kind of relate in certain ways and not be condescending either way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even during Shakespeare, it, I, I, I had the good fortune of talking to Peter Brook for 10 minutes many, many years ago. And I asked him a question about Shakespeare, and that's what he said. Shakespeare is not a museum piece. It has to be relevant to what is going on. These were real people with real problems, and you got to make it relevant. And, and I always get so mad when I see those period pieces with the language that is, you know, done in a certain folio technique, and you're just... You're just hearing ba 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 ba, and you have no idea what is going on, and that is that's a language. I mean, there's poetry in it, but it has to be immediate. It has to, it has to be relevant, as Natasha said. Otherwise, why do it? Go to the museum. Um, I find a lot of um, that there's there's a sense of isolation in some communities that I try to fight against um, because I think that our responsibility no matter what our background is is to contribute to the community we live in and the community we live in involves obviously the United States and, I, and that's why I think it's important to find the best ways to bring your culture into this community and rather than than just doing it for yourself or doing it a certain way that you think is right that is sort of like um, old school or whatever you want to call it. I, I've had a few more conservative theater goers from Bulgaria who've, come, who've seen my one-man show, which I've just recently started doing for Bulgarian audiences. Mostly it's been English-speaking audiences, but recently I've done a few performances for um, my own uh, communities here in Cincinnati. I did one, and 
Uh, a few people have come up to me and they've said, you cannot do Chudumir in English. You can't. You know, because Chudumir is considered to be one of the most authentic, especially village-style writers of Bulgaria who really get that quintessence of uh, what it is to be Eastern European, especially village Eastern European. Then I said, you know, yes, maybe some things are lost in translation. It's inevitable. I mean, when you translate Shakespeare into another language, some things are lost in translation. Check, same thing. But I'd say, okay, if I can't do Chudomir in English, what if the Brits say you can't do Shakespeare in Russian, or the Russians say you can't do Chekhov in English? Then we'll just keep doing stuff for ourselves, yeah. you know? And then, and what's the point, you know? And I, some of the greatest Shakespeare performances I've seen in Bulgarian, <laughs> you know? And some of the greatest Chekhovian performances I've seen in English. So I think that this exchange is, is absolutely vital to what we do. And that's why I'm so happy that these companies have started and I'm trying to do my best to continue this way of bringing our culture, translating into English and involving the American actors, the American audiences, the American directors, because they, as soon as you invite them, they are already interested and they want to work on it just as much as you're proud to bring it. Um, in founding your theater companies, um, were there any challenges you faced in trying to execute this mission of bringing um, well, I want them to answer because I'm going to take notes of that <laughs> since I started that. <laughs> she agrees with that. Yeah, uh, difficulties with bringing the, pl in terms of content or organization of the I guess generally, um, was there any resistance to your mission? No, on the contrary. I, I, I really wouldn't say there was, there, I, I, our mission was to bring the plays that are challenging in board form and content. and, and and everybody thought that yeah, like that, that theater, you know, serves the purpose. And so, no, I mean it's it's difficult to develop theater to get grants to get, you know, the actually create circumstances in which you can work freely. And that's we live in such society where you have to have money for that. And then um, learning about that was was really not easy process, at least for me. Um, in, in running the company and uh, figuring out where to fit, uh, how do you create, uh, um, how do you enable yourself to work? With, uh, how, because theater is expensive, it, as we said, it's not something you do it in your living room or basement. I mean, you need resources for that, you need to pay people, you need to rent the space, you need to do so many other, other things. It's a teamwork and, and, and essentially, I think Exipery, Sun Exipery said once, uh, if you want, if if you want people to build you a ship, you don't force them to do that. You you learn them to love the sea, and then they will build the ship. So the, the same idea is with theater. We, you kind of uh, uh, show people what's exciting about theater, and if they get it, then they are there to volunteer, to help you with things, to at least to start. Um, so that excitement, kind of having an idea uh, uh, that generates the team uh, brings you to uh, ability to actually do something because you can't do it alone. You really need uh, people, and you need to people. You need to work with people that that trust you and that you trust them. And so. I, I think it is interesting, like, uh, let me just tell you an example of our first show in Chicago was the, the Hour We Knew Nothing of Each Other, which is a Peter Handke, it's a German play, and it's basically one long series of stage directions. There is no text. There is not a single word. That's how it's written. There is like 10, 10 pages of stage directions, and like 15 people on stage, or it can be 20 or 10 or whatever. So we did a play, and it was very successful, and... You know, now I think like, and if this is true about European rap as well, you will hear uh, like thousands of people telling you that they've seen the show. Yeah. Well, at the yeah. time, yeah. there weren't thousands, mm -hmm. you know, so like, um, so like the legend grows, I think. Yeah. Um, so you do, you do one of those plays and it was really successful. So the next year, we were doing Alice in Wonderland and we got calls and everybody was, oh, so it's a silent Alice in Wonderland? <laughs> and we are like, no. They were like, well, I mean, the last one was silent, it was great, why don't you do a silent one? 
Like, why don't you do every play a silent one? Because you were so good at it. Um, which I think is one of those challenges that we as theater artists, and I guess artists maybe in general, mm -hmm. is like you're successful in something and people want you to do more of that because you were successful. And you're gonna get audiences. Mm -hmm. And, but that doesn't really serve you as an artist. You yeah. want to go do something else. And so you do, you know, plays with words. Surprising. Well, I mean, money is always the challenge, especially when you're dealing with works that are really not a box office, you know, have no box office recognition. But if you stick to your mission, you know, uh, and if you do what you do well, and honestly, you are going to, you know, you're going to have an impact. I, I remember, for example, we did this show called Stars in the Morning Sky by Alexander Galin, Soviet play from the early 80s. And it was based on a true event during the Olympic Games in Moscow in 1980. Um, the Soviets, the Soviet government took all the prostitutes and alcoholics and put them outside of Moscow during the duration of the Olympics, something actually that the Americans did during the Atlanta uh, Olympic Games. So they took that cue in 1996 from the Soviets. Um, but it was, it was a show that we were like, oh, nobody's going to come and see that. <laughs> and it was, it was a huge success. We sold out the show. We, we actually extended it. And um, I don't know how many of you know a lot about theater, but there is this uh, committee called the Jeff Committee that um, it's, uh, it's supposed to be like the Chicago kind of equivalent of the Tony Committee that recommends shows for um, uh, awards. And um, <laughs> we, we did not get recommended for that show and the quote was, it was just too Eastern European. <laughs> yeah, whatever that meant, right? It was just too Eastern European. And one Jeff Comedian member actually wrote me a personal saying that he was ashamed because the show was brilliant and he voted for it to be recommended. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think I totally agree the challenges because people like to label things like, okay, this theater is... <laughs> yeah doing that and this theater is doing that and, and uh, you really want to want to explore different forms I mean, I mean we did a silent play then we did an adaptation of a fairy tale then we did Chekhov then we did Shakespeare then we brought two Serbian plays so I mean it's hard to find a common denominator other than excellency work which is I think uh, and that's it, it the audience eventually accept that but it takes years to, to kind of find your identity outside of it because you don't do the same kind of plays um, because it's challenging it's much easier if you do one thing and do it all the time so you know you you perfect it but it's very difficult to start from scratch always but there is something honest artistically about that about not cashing in on 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 what you learn in last project that every painting you paint you start from scratch and you i mean obviously with age you you have experience that is reflected in your work, but in terms of material and, and form, you, you want you want to challenge yourself. And I would also say that like it is really interesting in both like European Rep and our theater company and a lot of other like I think similar similar groups. It's like you find a group of uh, uh, like-minded people, and in all our cases, the like-minded people were regular native English Americans who, you know, worked with us, gave us as much as we gave them, and, you know, contributed and followed and supported that particular mission, whatever the mission of the theater is. And so it was always this, um, yes, it's Eastern European, but with a lot of input from the local community that was, artistic community, that was really open to going places. Like, is it a, you know, Sov Soviet play, is it a, you know, crazy hunky who like just writes <laughs> stage directions, and um, and and so, you know, there is this real wonderful openness in the artistic community of the you know 
local Chicago artists or people who come to become local Chicago artists, wherever the heck they're from, um, that were part of this journey that is still going on for us. It's another story I just remembered. I, I mentioned earlier Roberto Zucco by Bernard Marie Cortez. Roberto Zucco is based on a serial killer who was really charming and um, his victims were falling in love with him. And um, <laughs> one of the reviews, I remember the, I mean, it was, it, we just got slaughtered, you know, by everybody. But I sp specifically remember the last line of this one review, it might have been even the trip that said, just the kind of crap that the French will like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true story. <laughs> team except for me is Americans which is really lovely for um, the, the director of my Bulgarian one-man show is an American guy um, and I found that crucial to be able to make it relatable to the audiences that I'm seeking to get and uh, the actors that I just directed a show at Trapdoor Theater last year called there's no power for the electric chair it's it's um, a play from the plot drama theater that won like every a scare, which is the Bulgarian equivalent of the Tony Award. <laughs> and um, my two actors were Americans. So I think that uh, collaboration, again, has to, is, is very um, crucial to the success of the production in this community and, and finding people who want to tell these stories, uh, regardless of their background, as long as they're willing to learn and to, to really immerse themselves in this kind of new style of writing or new style of, um, of, of, of storytelling it is absolutely important. I, I've learned just as much from Americans or English speakers doing my people's work as much as I've learned from Bulgarians uh, doing our work. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's very important to be inclusive in this art form. I mean, it is a collaborative art form. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, that. and most of our actors and designers were, uh, you know, American artists. So it was, I mean, they, they came to the process really curious and really open to, to the material and the way we work. Because in European Repertory Company, we we put a lot of stock in the process versus the result. Um, I mean, we were lucky we had a, our own space at the time, so, you know, we were able to work a play for longer than it usually a play is being rehearsed and, like, get really deep into the specifics of the characters and everything. And um, but it was it was a really uh, wonderful collaboration with those American artists who really bought into our vision and had their natural curiosity that was fueled by the material and by our own experience. Um, we had a company of actors actually uh, that I think most of them were Americans and they they were really curious by the work. They were very um, committed to the work and uh, gave everything to the work and so did you guys right yeah yeah i mean it's a yes theater by nature is co collaborative but it's a tricky word there are different levels of collaboration <laughs> i think true collaboration is not easy uh, uh natasha and i are we're, are we're married for how many years many years and and we she's a designer i'm director and she designed i think in almost every show i've done and we collaborate for real but we also fight so, so in I mean, and, and, <laughs> and that's how it was. Uh, at least during my artistic directorship, we really collaborated. We had a team of designers 
that and these meetings are I can't forget them. But they were they they are still memorable to me because they they were really exciting exchange of ideas and thoughts that weren't always that you wouldn't necessarily always agree. But so for a true collaboration, you have to be very patient and very giving and very understanding. And and so that's not always easy. Like I think as I'm aging, I'm less patient, which I think is normal. But it, in 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 theater. It's beautiful, like when people really collaborate, there's nothing so exi as exciting as, as, as that. Uh, but again, you have to have circumstances for that, you have to have, you know, right people that trust you and that you trust, and, uh, and that's, that's something that I think is really, uh, stays memorable. I, you know, as a designer, these are my two favorite directors, like I worked with both of them, and um, I think as a designer, you work with like I was. I am fortunate enough. I don't work necessarily with words. I help, you know, actors and directors kind of put in visual terms what they want certain things to be and how they want certain things to look. Uh, you know, but I deal with colors and with textures and with three-dimensionality of the forms and you know, with like this excitement of discovering certain things in very non-verbal, very visual sense. And what you do, like, you get the, you know, the boundaries from the directors. You know, they tell you what is your playground. And if they're good directors, you know, like they are, they let you play in that playground. And that is kind of like, that's the best collaboration, I think, for everybody on a certain project is to kind of have that um, safety and confidence that you can play within the certain set of rules or boundaries. Um, and so that, you know, when that works, it is beautiful. I remember like in Tuta, we had like at one moment, like a choreographer who joined us on the project. And he was like, oh man, I can't wait for the production meeting. Now, those of you who've been in theater, production meetings are not the most exciting places. But he was like, I heard that your production <coughs> meetings are awesome. <coughs> Because everybody fights with everybody else, including Jaco and I, you know, and it's like, because you want to, re, you know, rehash certain ideas, you want to talk about, like, where you want things to go. And I think what is really impor important for, like, everybody that process is, like, there is an ambition and sometimes there is, like, this, you know, willingness to go certain places, but not everybody knows how to get to that certain place, if that makes sense. So it's, it's a wonderful thing where you, where you have that group of people who actually, that you can trust, that if you go out on a limb, you're going there because everybody else is going to get there too. Does that make sense? So that you're not kind of like left hanging out to dry with your ideas at the end of the project. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's always like, it's, it's a very, it's a long process. And it's very interesting, and it's true at like European Rep, like they had a very long rehearsal process, right? Like at least the place I was involved in. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, and the same thing in Tuta. I think that like we were always, um, you know, this there is this wonderful immediacy of like working on place, place for like two or three weeks, and then you're right there in front of the audience. But there is an even more wonderful, like when you can kind of mature into it when you give everybody in the room more time to actually really discover what it is all about. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about this a bit in our class today because we read Lost in Translation by Eva Hoffman. And um, uh, she talks, she uh, is a novel and in most of it she talks about um, speaking Polish and speaking English. and feeling different and feeling the words like signify different things in each language even though they mean the same things uh, and so I was wondering what it's like to uh, act especially but also direct and costume in a different language and if, like you feel different or your body feels different like saying the same words in different languages. Yeah I think that that's an amazing question it's very um, it's it's very challenging sometimes, and I with Shakespeare, for example, I spent uh, like a season and a half at the Stratford Festival in, in Canada, and I had to play. I was in Romeo and Juliet, and I also had to play a British explorer 
in, uh, of northern Canada during the John Franklin expedition. And that was a story about the Inuit communities. So I think I said to myself, I might be the only Bulgarian-American in Canada playing a Brit in an Inuit play yeah. in history. <laughs> so um, I find that the language, uh, especially Eastern European languages, they are they're very powerful, they're very, uh, I find that English is a little more lyrical, it's a little more um, a kind of, for lack of a better word, pleasant sounding, but, and, and, and uh, whereas, whereas Bulgarian is a very strong language, and especially with Shakespeare, it helps me to actually read the stuff in Bulgarian first, mm. it, with a good translation. Uh, we have, we're lucky enough to have Valery Petrov is probably one of the best translators of Shakespeare ever. <laughs> and he manages to preserve the rhyming and the meter in an amazing way in a different language, which is absolutely amazing. And um, to me, I, that, that text speaks to, to my core a lot more so that I can fuel the English with that essence, which I would not necessarily be able to do if, uh, if I approached the English first. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very, very tricky thing. And also with um, the work I'm doing now with translating Bulgarian plays into English and seeing how they sound in English, there's a lot of things you're actually discovering in this new language. So you think lost in translation, but sometimes things are found in translation, especially if the play is um, very appropriate to the current setting. Like the electric chair play, for example, I don't know how long it's been since Bulgaria's had a death penalty, but it's been about 30 something years, 30 years or so. So this play is running in Plovdiv and I thought, well, wow, this would be way more relevant in the United States. And in English, it just came alive in a way that I did not really see in the Plovdiv production. So that was, I think, a lot due to the language. It's, yeah, like, <laughs> I do the same thing actually. <laughs> When I'm doing Shakespeare, I go to the Bulgarian translation because the poet that he was referring to was, uh, he was actually banned by the communists to write, which was kind of lucky because he spent his time translating Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the funny thing is that he doesn't even speak English. Really? Yes. Wow. Yeah, he speaks like three, four other languages, but not English. Um, English is my third language language you know I first learned Bulgarian because I'm from Bulgaria then Russian and then English so it's it's um, it's tricky it's tricky you know I um, when I when I act I always make sure that I'm I learn the lines quickly well first of all you know I want to be on my feet without the script in my hand but I also know that I need to be so sure in every word because when when you when you break your concentration or when you forget a word it's difficult to improvise in a language that is not your own i mean you could always substitute a word and improvise something but there will be always like a you know a tinge of doubt about it oh my god is that does that sound can i say that um, in translation, I have translated a lot of Chekhov plays from Russian into English. And Russian and English are very, very different languages. Russian, Russians have like 17 things for one thing, you know? And in American, it's the exact opposite. In one word, it could mean 17 things, you know? So. But what I also love about English language is how laconic and precise it is. And when you get, for example, a text by Chekhov where a sentence could go on with commas and semicolons and dashes and all kinds of other punctuation for about half a page, you could actually break it down in English in three, four, five different sentences and lose nothing of the intention and that's what i that's what has always excited me i i've i've actually found so much excitement in like translating chekhov as much as i you know receive it from acting or directing it because it's just it it's almost like breaking some code it's like oh oh 
this is so great. It's so Chekhovian. And it's in English. And when I say English, American English. Mm -hmm. uh, and because you take this thing that was written over a hundred years ago and you make it so immediate and so relevant and you see how people actually respond to the humor because Chekhov is very funny but if you look at some of the old like English translations that were probably done by dictionary translation I just I mean they're depressing and foreboding and it's just like you just want to kill yourself but you yeah, you miss the humor and and I think actually American English has allowed Chekhov to have another life in this country and I'm not the only one who's translating Chekhov everybody everybody who's directing Chekhov now does their own <laughs> translations and adaptations what they do now is they take a like a literary translation and they do an adaptation of it and it's just smooth and it's it's great yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know about translating plays. I try to do it. It's not for me. It's difficult. Uh, but I'm really interested in, uh, interested as a director in, in an <coughs> actor performing in non-native language. I think that must be in, insanely hard, difficult. It's um, insane. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. And I, I always thought that. I wanted to explore that. I'm hoping one day with Yasin maybe I get a chance to, to, to do exactly that. Really? How does how does that what I mean just think about it. I mean you are um, living between illusion and reality. You are in this liminal psychological space and then you are in between two languages too. Mm -hmm. That that that's crazy. I mean and there aren't that many actors in this country that main career uh, as professional successful actors that are not Americans that are, that are acting in non-native language yes and it's one one of them uh, so I just I just think that that's fascinating it would be great to do something with that as as, a, as, as you know consciously explore that through a piece of work if I can add to that, like uh, Jaco and I had uh, until recently a house in which the whole basement was Jaco's study and a library, in which while one wall was in um, Serbo-Croatian or what we call our language, like all kind of Yugoslav languages, right now, and then one was English or like two were English, and then one was German because he also kind of speaks German, and I can't remember ever doing a play that he didn't do all three translations and then comparing and like figuring things out and what things mean and how many different things and different meanings are in whatever play they are including you know Chekhov or including like non-German plays or you know probably Shakespeare you know for, for like um, so I think that there is like you always get informed by other cultures by other people saying it the other way because you find different meanings in that and that's true even in visual sense. It's like you can get um, maybe more metaphorically or abstractly, but you can get really inspired, like me in my work, by an artist who, you know, this guy, whoever that is, mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, I should probably know who that is, but I don't. So, um, but you know, like that, like the colors inspire you, the textures inspire you, something else expi inspires you to, to kind of go, and, and, and that kind of goes, translates and travels well, you know. I can also tell you like from my, my, like me as an immigrant into this country, there were many funny situations that just happen in the rehearsal room or working with actors and other people that come from the language barriers or the language differences. I remember teaching at James Madison University and there was like a huge cast of Kiss Me Kate or something. So there was like, you know, 40 kids who were like in a show and I told them to put a mouse in their hair instead of to put a moose in their hair. <laughs> and you know, you could hear them all kind of like sniggering, and, you know, but they, won't, they didn't want to laugh at me. I thought it was really funny that like they always, you know, instructed them to put a mouse. Looking for mice. <laughs> um, you mentioned humor, and I, that's something that really interests me, is how comedy and, and, and different cultures humor translates to other languages. Um, Chudomir, for example, 
Like, the Bulgarian sense of humor is very dark. We laugh at ourselves a lot and our misfortunes because, as a people, we've had a lot of them. <laughs> and, um, the Balkans. Yeah. Well, yeah. The Balkans. Yeah, the Balkans. Um, so, the first step is the translation, then it's the adaptation, which I've always had an American friend help me with. Especially if I'm targeting American audiences, and then it's the it's the how do you relate the essence of this world, which is not really in the words, it's in the understanding of reality, really. And for example, I have one story in the show about uh, the main character's uncle dies, and on the way to the graveyard, he falls out of the coffin, and they lose him. <laughs> and now Bulgarians find that really funny, but American audiences usually just gasp. <laughs> or, or yeah, or an old lady who is senile, can't hear, can't see, and uh, the main character gets so sick of her, he just leaves her in the middle of the city and just runs away from her, and, and things like that. That I, it, it takes a while, and it takes a very <laughs> fine touch of a good director and hopefully a good, a, a good actor as well, to allow, to give the audience that time to adjust to being able to laugh at stuff like that. Because especially a, a Western audience is, I think, a little more sensitive to stuff like that and they don't laugh at first. But eventually they do, if you give them that, if you don't beat them over the head with it, you know. Um, so that is a, a translation that isn't really in the words, but it's in the communication with the audience. It's that exchange, that, the meeting in the middle. I think like it's awesome to see the collaboration that you guys have done with your own work and where you guys are from, like individually and then together, and then with Americans and non Eastern European. How do you think this is like a unique to theater? Is it because you guys are immigrants? Because you're from a specific region? And I ask that because, you know, given the current administration, it's very hard to believe that this collaboration exists. So, like, what what do you believe, like, what's going on here that allows for this, like, space for such collaboration, translation, and adaptation that's so cross-cultural and just cross-humans as well? Well, we live in a sad time right now, but I, I'm an optimist by nature. Um, and I, I just hope that this is just an aberration that would pass. Um, I've, I mean, obviously the country is not the same as it was when I immigrated here in 1990. Um, but I think for the most part, people continue to be generous to immigrants and, and naturally curious. Um, it's, uh, I read a great Instagram posting from uh, um, Werner Herzog, the German director, which is, um, um, it's kind of a warning to America. Uh, and I'm gonna paraphrase it, but it was like, um, one third, Congratulations, America, you're in the same situation as Germany was during the Nazi years. One third wanted, one third of the population wanted to kill the other one third of the population, while one third just stood and watched. So I, I just hope that that one third doesn't stand and watch. Um, it's a very painful, um, subject for me as an immigrant because I've lived here for so many years and I have always encountered generosity and um, affection from even from random Americans who are not friends of mine or even acquaintances I've always found Americans to be naturally curious about other people and cultures and I'm really devastated of what is happening right now and how one person could have such a big effect on what is happening. And like I said, I just hope this is an aberration and it passes. Um, so, I mean, these guys moved back to Europe, so <laughs> maybe you should talk to them. <laughs> we, we are, but we are moving back not to leave completely and we are moving back because certain phase of our work is completed. Not, not so much 
that you know uh, I actually think that regardless of the fact that I'm moving back is that there is political situation in Serbia is not much better um, and I'm looking for work over there uh, looking to do some 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 bring some of my immigrant experience in my new country old old new country it's complicated um, I actually think that rough political times are great times for the for, for collaboration. That's when people get together and that's when real subjects surface and that's when things, I mean, it's like we, we did survive our country sort of falling apart through theater. That was our uh, way of expressing. That was your, that's your voice, you know, in, in, in and that's why it makes sense uh, to, to actually do theater when, when, because you can speak, you can say something. Um, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it, it's, less money, it's less grants, it's but still if you're young and if you have energy and if you have need to speak, and that's where it happens in a group of people, in a team of work, and that's when you kind of articulate your ideas, your attitude toward the world, to the politics, toward everything. So uh, that's when you, it, it's happening. You don't wait until it passes, you respond to it. To I, I think that the current political times have brought uh, side of this country that we have actually ignored for a while um, and it's very important that we acknowledge that it exists. I absolutely love this country. I spent more time in the United States than I have in Bulgaria and I, fi I think of myself as a completely dual <laughs> citizen uh, and, and, and I have dual affinity for both for both nations and uh, I, I think that he's absolutely right that, that the more we are struggling with our society, the more theater becomes exciting and it challenges the audiences, challenges the artists. Um, a great professor of mine uh, in Cincinnati once said, theater is where the bad kids go. You know, whenever you want to find things to challenge you and find the people who will give you that kick in the ass, you know, it's, it's in the rehearsal room. Um, be it politically, societally, or, or emotionally. <laughs> So I think it's it's a really good time to create art. I, I think that like um, when you are an artist and you're a theater artist or any other kind of artist, your duty is to um, redefine or define or um, research uh, what's happening around you. And I think that's why it's kind of censorship to exists because you are always on the other side of what's accepted because it is your duty to question what's happening. And it is our duty right now, I think as a society in general, to question what's happening and to kind of react to it in the most positive or the most um, humane way possible because that's the only thing that lasts. Um, because it is going to pass and it will pass um, with our um, not influence, but like a participation and collaboration, and I think that's our our. I don't know, know that it's even duty. It's kind of your reason to do art, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think like I remember Jacob and I coming to the United States in 1990. I think you came the same year, right? Uh, and we came to go to graduate school, and we came from a country that was just about to fall apart. And we were like, all theater is political. And everybody was around us was like, oh, no, it isn't. And you're like, no, no, yes, it is. And they're like, well, there's all these musicals. And, uh, and Jack was like, well, they're the most political thing of all. It's a different thing of what kind of politics you're supporting. Because you can support any kind of politics, depending on what you put behind it. Also, in any play, you can support any kind of politics, if that makes sense. It depends how you direct it. Who do you support with it? With it? Yeah, we also come, we we're coming from Eastern Europe, as you know, in, in, at the time of Soviet Union, wasn't a free society, most of the countries, all of the countries. And, but we had an excellent theater. And, and it's interesting, uh, in, 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 a, in a strange way, there, there was understanding between the audience and theater artists that bypassed the gov government and officials. Yeah. You could not have plays that directly address issues. So, you would have to do Shakespeare or Chekhov or something, but you had to make it relevant for the for the and and that so you you had to use metaphors and heavy ones. Um, so the audience got very sophisticated. The, the audience was able to read through the, 
subtext that was very hidden, that was really, there was a code language developed, and that made artists really work hard on using their imagination. So we, we had wonderful directors, wonderful designers throughout these difficult years of no freedom. Uh, um, so uh, that's an example. We don't have to do that anymore in, in Eastern Europe. We can speak now openly and write openly. And, uh, so, but you know, yet during the Cold War, that there was the case. I have a quick question. I'm looking for it. We'll see. Maybe that's okay. What is what is your ideal next project? Ideal next project. Uh, and we were talking earlier about dreams. That in some ways. Uh, uh, your career path is a dream realized and that you were able to, to create all this wonderful year and succeed to, to, to a large extent. And that what's the next dream if, uh, if you could just conjure it? Well, I've been talking to Jaco about this. <laughs> I want to do. I want Jaco to direct me in Diary of a Madman by Nikolai wow. Gogol, and we've been talking about this for over a year now. Yeah. So um, I really hope to to actually get this to fruition. So that's my and that that's a great ideal great next project. Yeah, text to kind of explore these thoughts and ideas we discussed. Today. Yeah, to reflect the current environment that we live in as well. It would be heavy on metaphor, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where would you, where, in what space would that be? Well, you know, we have, we've, we've talked about possibly having it done at uh, the studio space at Steppel, the new black box, but it might be not as easy to do it as a Steppel production, so we might have to do it through a company. So, but uh, we're exploring it. Um, well, I, the company I recently started, we just announced a new play, the first play we're doing, it's uh, called Sunday Evening by Zakhari Karabashi, 2009 Oscar winner of Best New Bulgarian Play. Um, and that's, I want that to be uh, an established institution in Chicago that is really a playwrights medium that provides of uh, a stage for undiscovered voices, and, and not not undiscovered Bulgarian or or Eastern European actors, but especially playwrights, mm -hmm. because you know you have very successful Bulgarian actors that tour the Bulgarian communities of Europe, Canada, the United States. I don't think they need much more exposure <laughs> at this point. I but the playwrights whose work is so good and and, and, re and relatable somehow don't get the chance to leave uh, that the country much and that's I want to give them that opportunity and to keep, keep building that company that's so yeah. <laughs> uh, well we were just mentioning how complicated um, our situation is of going back and forth first of all I think as an artist even you're an immigrant um, I don't know if you guys would agree but like I think of us as like um, kids of divorced parents <laughs> where you kind of always think that you're the other side is better or you're missing out something on the other side mm -hmm. so you kind of like you're here and you're missing something there and then you're there and you're missing something you know it just kind of like that's the like the emotional like you really feel because you love both both sides um, I think that what Jaco and I are doing is kind of trying to create a little bit more or different space for us to kind of do certain other things including hopefully a movie soon so um and if that was happening that wouldn't have happened if we continued living here because there was just no space no money so you know things work a little differently like in other places and what was that milos foreman said like in um you make movies in america with money you make movies in europe with friends and we do have a lot of friends in europe <laughs> Yeah, to, to be frank, I, I don't know what the dream dream project is, but uh, I, any exciting project for me is uh, an opportunity to dream. Um, uh, I would love to to kind of 
do something with this different experience of different culture, living in America, living the languages that happen, how the, how an actor works with with different languages. And I might be this project with Ziasin, but I, I really think the world is shifting and changing so quickly that we have to keep up with also our responding to that. You, you know. Um, we live in such a mobile culture that now it's not like it's so easy to be here and there and in between and um, so I, I'm, I'm I'm excited about that so, so maybe something's gonna come out of it. If not, then I think this is the great moment to end the formal part. Um, please join me in thanking our guests. And, uh,